So we're in Psalm 77, and I'm not going to do a test, but I'm going to give you a quick recap that might be a, um, a help. He's, he's the music director of King David, this chap who's written six passage of ten uh, psalms that are really significant in the, in the overall canon because of their emphasis on the corporate whole. So if you've got your script, if you've got your Bibles open, I'll just quickly go over some of the verses that we looked at and then I'll come to something else <coughs> by way of conclusion. If you remember at the beginning, Asaph, this musical director, is in something of a struggle to maintain his hope, essentially. He's struggling to have the hope to seek the Lord, isn't he? That's a horrible, it's a horrible thought, that. I'm sure some of us... I'm sure all of us, in one way or another, have had moments, seasons, where there's been more of a struggle to pray, to sing, to play. And this, yeah, to worship. And so it's a privileged insight into this man's life. And in, the, in verse 2 of Psalm 77, he says, In the day of trouble, I seek the Lord. There's a struggle to do that, and so therefore there's... <coughs> I can't remember who it was that prayed earlier, but there are demonic forces, are there not, mm-hmm. against us coming before him in the way that we've described this morning. Um, we're talking about sleepiness, spiritual lethargy. And again, because Asaph's burden was the corporate whole, it's right to think about this in a personal way, as well as how we're thinking about the church more widely. I appreciate that's, that's less of a natural thought for some of you than it might be for others. But it's right, as we said this morning, that we're not just thinking about our own individual worlds, our own individual churches. And I believe some of the lyrics that we've just been singing. I don't know if we could maybe get that last, there was a- It'll take a minute or two to warm up. That's okay. There was an absolute killer uh, line at the end of that song that we'll come to. But while that's loading up, let me read you two pages Um, of A.W. Tozer's book called The Dangers of a Shallow Faith, Awakening from Spiritual Lethargy, which which is what this psalm is about. And I think we would all say a hearty amen to the desire to be roused. To be honest, a post-lunch session speaking is quite apt for this, isn't it? Because let's be honest, there is sleepiness for us all. Let me just read you this. And then I'll have a couple of thoughts and then I'll, we'll just pray together, I think. This is a chapter that he entitled The Effect of Spiritual Lethargy. And he quotes the first few verses of Isaiah 52. Let me read these. Awake, awake. Put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth... There shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake thyself from the dust. Arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the hands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus saith the Lord, you have sold yourselves for naught, and ye shall be redeemed without money. Notice in that passage the imperatives to awake and to shake thyself, shake thyself from the dust. This is what Tozer, A.W. Tozer, I'm sure most of us have heard of him, says about this. This familiar Old Testament passage in Isaiah describes a natural, national, literal revival yet to come. Although Zion refers to Israel, its spiritual content is for all who name the name of Israel's God in truth. I say this because sometimes men want to slough over what is written in the Old Testament as not applying to them. But Isaiah's words were fully applied to New Testament believers by John the Baptist, Christ himself, Paul, and other New Testament apostles and writers of epistles. They quoted Isaiah without hesitation and applied it directly without excuse or apology to the New Testament church. If they did it, we can do it. 
And not only can we do it, but we should do it. He goes on to talk about the Jews for a little bit, but he's talking here about spiritual lethargy. Let me just read this to two paragraphs. This call, awake, awake, is addressed to sleeping people. To sleep is to be unconscious or semi-conscious. Anybody relate to that at the minute? Yes. It's an interesting thought, though, isn't it? That to be asleep can be either semi-unconscious or semi-conscious. It is to have a dimming of feeling and thought. And awareness is either absent or faint. You might say compromised. When riding on a train, I, f I sleep all night. In fact, I sleep better on a train than I do when I'm not on a train. That is, I stay asleep longer. The lulling of the track must take me back to my childhood because I'm, I'm sort of nursed and rocked to in sleep with the rhythmic beat of the wheels and the swaying of the train. Yet I'm never quite asleep. And the next day, I am rather groggy, even though I slept all night. This is an odd situation, because while I'm asleep, I'm only partly asleep. There is an awareness that is not quite there, and yet it is there, very faintly. The light never quite goes off, it just dims until you cannot read by it. This book I would encourage you to read as a devotional. It's a, it's a Tozer's obviously a, a good, solid person. But the, the purpose of this psalm, I think, is to get us to think honestly about the corporate whole and how that relates to our personal spiritual state. I think in the limited time I have with you guys, I want to just be honest again as an extension from this morning and say that I, my conviction is that the church at large are not in a good place. Paul's main metaphor in the New Testament, as we all know, for the, for the church is a body. And if a body has a broken ankle, it's not just that the ankle is wounded, it's that the whole body, in a sense, carries a wound. Um, and if we went around the room now, we could have different input about what everybody thinks about different denominations, different theological positions, and so on and so forth. But the end time picture of a, of a church prepared is a church free from wrinkle, free from flaw, free from compromise. Now, that doesn't mean to say that we are to somehow pray or pursue a church that's you know, it's a myth, isn't it, to think that we'll ever be perfect this side of the Lord's return. Nevertheless, there is a picture of a church who has come to their senses, woken, I think, to the need to come before the Lord in humility in a way that I would argue historically maybe has never been. You know, we could, we could speak about the Reformation, we could focus on critical moments throughout the centuries where there have been seismic events in the church, but if we truly believe that the Lord is coming, regardless of whether that's our life in our lifetime or not, we have to believe, therefore, that there is going to be a radical preparation for the church. And so what I'm talking about here in terms of spiritual sleepiness, lethargy, is really um, the chaos of the church as we currently are. And in this psalm, I'm encouraged because I see the Lord putting his finger on Asaph's mind. If you just glance down at verse 4, remember we had a cellar after the session this morning, a kind of stop and think. That's what that word means. That's what I think the church should have done during COVID. Should have stopped and thought. And then in verse 4, you hold my eyelids open. That's not a very nice thought, is it? I've been to the Specsavers quite a lot recently, and I don't know if you've ever had an eye examination. Some of it's quite nice. They hold up little things, and you look at the wall, and you just have a nice chat, and it's quite therapeutic. But then they get to the bit where they put a cotton bud thing under your eyelid. Have you ever had that? Maybe it's just me. That's happened to me several times. <laughs> and, it's, and it's a horrible thing. You know, it's not, it's not agony, but it's a very unnatural thing to have a cotton wool bud put under your eyelid just to check if everything's okay 
you hold my eyelids open. It's this picture that Asaph is expressing of God Almighty holding his eyelids open. What does he mean? Well, I think what he's what is happening in this kind of nighttime moment for Asaph, where he refines his song, is that the Lord is putting his finger on his mind. It's not so much about his body, it's not so much about the physical eyelid or his physical eye, it's what that's representing. So when I read that, I imagine Asaph in the watches of the night, struggling to sleep because of grief or because of anxiety or whatever it is that keeps us awake, Whatever it is that keeps you awake, you hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. Remember, this is Asaph's communal, personal lament in that order. So I think the Lord is getting Asaph here into a place where his mind is changed. And as I said this morning, what's, he, what's, what's the emphasis here? What's the changing of the mind? Well, he considers a, there's a theme running through of remembrance, the importance of remembering the covenant promises, what God did in, in Israel's history particularly, wilderness wanderings, etc. That's a theme that recurs. But then we came to the personal, verse 6, let me remember my song in the night, let me meditate in my heart. And then we came, just before lunch, then my spirit made a diligent search. And what follows, and we're not going to go through this now, but this is maybe just to give, leave with you, and then, I don't know, if you take that into your own devotionals. What follows is six questions from Asaph to the Lord, which constitutes this diligent search. So initially there's this struggle to, to make a diligent search, and then he comes and asks the Lord in humility, Lord, please, would you allow me, would you enable me? This is what we're all saying today, isn't it, I think? As Val expressed there, there is the sense that we want to be able to improve, grow, and so on and so forth. So there are these questions. I'm not going to go through all of them now, but I am going to focus on the very last one. If you just look down at the text, and from verse 6 through to verse... Nine. There are six questions, and Spurgeon, reflecting on, on these questions, reflected on them like this. He saw it like a machete hacking away at unbelief. And that he used questions, Asaph, the singer, he used the questions to hack away at the tormenting sense of, well, you see that reflected in the questions. I'll give you an example. The first one, let me remember my song in the night is where he's been. Will the Lord spurn forever? And then number two, and it never again be favourable. These are the kind of questions he's asking. And of course, think of them as statements. Think of them as positive statements. This is what's going on in Asaph. He's not having a crisis of faith at this point. He's being awoken from slumber. So when you look at the, the scripture, I think it's right to, to read it as the Lord will never spurn forever, the Lord will always be favourable. His steadfast love will never cease. His promises are for all time. God has surely not forgotten to be gracious. Do you see what I'm saying? So read those questions with this reality in mind. But let me just, let me just say this one thing about the, the final question of the six that I think is central to this psalm. He says in verse 9, has God forgotten to be gracious? And then has he in anger shut up his compassion? The struggle with this corporate reality that Asaph was dealing with was a sense of the Lord's anger regarding his people. And whether you read Hosea or Jeremiah, or Isaiah, any of the major prophets, the narrative of spiritual unfaithfulness and adultery is constant throughout. When we read this today and then think about applying it into our New Testament 
post-cross context. How does the anger of the Lord, how does that work? Was his wrath not fully assuaged, satisfied at Calvary? Of course it was. Does that mean, though, that God isn't angry at sin now? Does it mean that he is somewhat indifferent to unfaithfulness in the church, his covenant people? Of course not. And so I think it is right, as we consider what would be important in the church corporately turning into a faithful posture, it would be to wrestle with the question, what is God? What could it be that God is angry about within his people at this time? I had a chat at the back of the gentleman, sorry, I forgot your name. Peter. Peter. Yeah. In terms of some of what, I'm going to use the word, there are abhorrent things happening in our world that are increasingly normalised, drip-fed through advertisements and TV and, dare I say, liberal theology. The first bishop of this city, or the city over the, over the water, J.C. Ryle, would have had and didn't have any of it. Unfortunately, men like J.C. Ryle are quite few and far between today. And so as we come through the psalm, and again, I commend it to you to spend time, and I'll make my notes available if it would be of any help this coming week. We have to come through this sense of in Asaph's remembering his song, coming into a place of spiritual vitality rather than lethargy, he had to confront some of these questions. And I think it's a pipe dream that the church today would hope for there to be this thing that we like to talk about a lot, revival, without there being a proportionate response to the day in which we're living. Hence there being three cellars through this psalm, stop and think. I've said this publicly many times, that I think it's conceivable that the Lord could lead this nation through years of repentance. We talk about a day of repentance for however many million aborted babies as though that was a virtue. A day of repentance for millions of aborted children. Are you having... I, I do feel angry about that. Because I think, it's, I think it's a disgrace to talk about a national repentance that is on one day. Verse 13. I don't know if you've got your scripture, just the, the Bible. Look what it says. Verse 13. Your way, O, Lord, o God, is holy. What God is great like our God? Can we come before the Lord personally this week and say to him, Lord, we don't, I don't feel about some of these corporate realities what you want me to feel about them. There's kind of a need almost to be a bit apologetic for speaking in a certain way publicly because it might, un, it might unsettle some people, it might offend some people. He's a thrice holy God, isn't he? And we come before the Lord of glory and I think it's right that we have a renewed sense of his holiness. What else can come out of Selah but a, a sense of that? Let me just finish with what is a positive, wonderfully comforting picture. If you read from verse 16, again in your own time, it's very, very evocative of Psalm 18. If you read Psalm 18 next to these verses, verse 16 through to uh, 18 particularly, it's the, it's the similar kind of violent language that David used when, if you remember in Psalm 18, David cried to the Lord, which is what we say, see Asaph doing at the beginning of this psalm. And in Psalm 18, it's very specific language. It's, it's like David's prayer is pictured like an arrow that goes into the ear of God. And God responds aggressively, violently on behalf of of David, and it's pictured in the language of, that we see here of waters crashing and clouds pouring water. It's evocative of Job. But we come to verse 19, and bear in mind what I've just said there. 
about the holiness of God. Verse 13, your way, O God, is holy. And then we see your way again in verse 19, the same way. And Asaph is remembering the covenant of old, remembering the way that God worked faithfully for his people as he desperately is going, wants to for us today, if only we would heed his call to repentance. Your way was through the sea. This way of holiness is a way through the sea, the great Red Sea, your path through the great waters, yet your footprints were unseen. Isn't that a wonderful picture in the midst of all the drama? Even if you can't feel him, even if you don't have tears flowing or goosebumps or however it is that you discern the presence of the Lord, Asaph was recognising here, yet your footprints were unseen. Do we need to see his footprints? Is his word enough for us? Do we need to have some... I'm, not, I'm a charismatic, I believe in the gifts of the Spirit, but do we need to have emotionally driven, often, moments in worship to know the assurance of his eternal presence? Absolutely, Naomi. No, we don't. You're right. When I... I'll just close on this, Ashley. When I read this... I was thinking about the Israelites in this horrible place of a sea before them and an army of Pharaoh approaching behind. How do we relate to that today in the church? This is how I relate to that. There will be no ocean in the New Jerusalem, in heaven, we know that. Now that might be a disappointment for some of us in one sense, but let me assure you there will be no disappointment in heaven. What a paradox. There will be no ha uh, ocean. There will be no sea. Sea represents separation. That's one of the things that biblically it represents. Separation between man and God. And if you imagine Moses and Aaron. Ma Moses particularly. Because God spoke to Moses and, and told him to do things that he didn't to Aaron. What was that like in that moment? And how does that relate today? Well, this I look at the state of the church. And I say this in love, and my heart breaks. When I, when I think of the church, I long for us all to be corporately prepared. I long for truth to resound. I long for courage in the pulpit. I long for the name of Jesus to be truly lifted up, that men would truly be drawn to him. I long for there to be clarity on things that shouldn't be agreed to disagree about. I long for Christ being a Christian to mean something again out there. If you ask the average person what does it mean to be a Christian, they don't know. One church says this, another church over there will say something polar opposite, quite possibly. So the sea and the ocean, the, separate, the separating thing that I see that I, I feel is a, a comparable um, or at least a, a metaphorical reality is this chaos of the church. And verse 20, which is the final verse, promises this wonderful leading. And it's not over the sea. Notice that it's through the sea. Anybody can make a boat and go over an ocean. This is through the ocean. And the language of Exodus, as we should all know, very specifically talks about two walls of water either side and the Israelites pass through. This is a making of a way where there is literally no way. This is not, oh, I can't see the way. This is, there is literally no way. God doesn't take his people over the sea. He takes them through it. And where there is a, a seemingly impassable, impossible situation today and maybe I can encourage us you know on a personal level you'll be facing perhaps some impossible impassable dislodging things that you referred to we're facing some of those things at the minute but his people were led through the Red Sea has God changed he'll never change he led verse 20 we'll close here you led your people like a flock beautiful, tender language of Jesus, the Good Shepherd. 
evocative of Psalm 23, by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Imperfect men, but who would come to a place of remembering their own song in the night, and whose heart before a thrice holy God was one of fear and awe and love. And I believe that the Lord does want to... Um, bring a reformation in the church by his spirit and it will be at the hands of men who have learned to find their song in the night I'm just going to recap here the, th the things that we talked about earlier the day of our corporate trouble is clear I'd be interested to talk to anybody who would disagree with that if you don't think we're in a day of corporate trouble the world see that we're in a day of corporate trouble it's important to own the day of corporate trouble as our personal day of corporate trouble. That's what the psalm is for. That's what Asaph's psalms were for. The Lord wants us to enter into travail and diligent search so as to move from lethargy to urgency. The Lord wants us to acknowledge where we can't remember our song. I had a night this week like that, some situations and some attack from very, I won't go, don't need to go into the detail, but there are days sometimes when that feels harder, but he wants us to acknowledge when we can't remember our song, he wants to give us a new song. And in, sen in some senses that's daily. Unbelief can be cut down, those six questions that acted to cut away the unbelief that was inhibiting him. If all churches were to view themselves as a microcosm of the whole, which they are, the cellars in this psalm, unto repentance and radical change, I think would result in the Lord's return being ushered nigh to use the language of Peter. And then finally, this miraculous passage through whatever that is, whether it's on the personal level or the corporate level, and again, that's the emphasis of what we've read, this miraculous passage through will require the muscular leadership of shepherds trained by the anguish of Asaph's, Asaph's psalm. This is A.W. Tozer. The early church was in wonderment of Christ. He dazzled them and stirred within such feelings of amazement that they could never get over Christ. All they talked about was Christ. All they thought about from morning to night was Christ. Christ was their only reason for living and they were more than willing to die for him. For to me to live is Christ last week and to die is gain. Should we just pray? Father, we... We do come before you humbly in this moment, in the holiness of your presence. And we thank you that whether in our lives personally or nationally, you do in grace and mercy lead us to significant moments. Significant moments where we understand something maybe for the first time, salvation or tipping points that lead us into a more faithful place with you. And Lord, we do yearn, like the psalmist, praying, we moan, we yearn for faithfulness within the church that would glorify your precious name. So we thank you for your living word, active, double-edged, able to discern the thoughts and attitudes and of the human heart. And I pray for us all, pray for this church in particular, but we do pray for the body of Christ in this nation, that there will be a fresh appreciation for the preciousness of your living word and to be able to read 
these kind of psalms and respond faithfully. We pray that in the denominational maze, all of these different viewpoints and perspectives, that you would achieve something in this day that would be comparable to passing through an ocean. That truth would become clear, that there would be agreement where historically there hasn't been, that you'd bring conviction where there previously was just dullness. Lord, our longing above all things, in keeping with those words from prison in Philippians, is that you would be honoured and glorified in your people, in your bride, being prepared for the day that you return. And we pray, Maranatha, we pray, come Lord Jesus, in the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.